All right, welcome to the Corey Jones Show. I, of course, am Corey Jones. I'm here with Dr. Sean Hubbard, and we're going to talk about something that's on everybody's mind today. But before we get to that, I just want to let you know a little bit about what my company does, Safety Man Consulting, safetyman.co. Safetyman.co on all your social media platforms, whether it be LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or even TikTok. Mostly pictures of my boxer dogs on TikTok, but I am on TikTok as well. At Safety Man, we do things to keep you safe, your organization, your school, your daycare, your house of worship, any place you have a lot of people, and even your home. We do firearms training, taser training, self-defense training, and we do crisis management planning. So any unforeseen emergency, whether it be criminal, nature, or a traumatic medical event, we train you to train your people to stay safe. Speaking of staying safe, I'm here with a, a doctor who is a neurologist. That's correct. That's almost like a brain surgeon, right? <laughs> I'm a neurohospitalist. A, a neurohospitalist? That's right. All right. Dr. Sean, we've been on each other's shows a few times. We have a pretty good relationship. And the one thing that I will say is your bedside manner, your personality, and your knowledge of what we're going to talk about today is, is just up far and above anything I could imagine. So I want to thank you for that. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here today. What's on everybody's mind today is COVID and the vaccine. Sure. And first off, you, you, you just got your second vaccination, right? I did. Yeah, so tell me about that. Okay, so I was very excited to get the vaccine, first of all. And I should say I was excited because of my perspective. It's been a very challenging year. We've had some painful times. Um, it started, as you know, early in the year with a lot of uncertainty, not knowing what to do. Then when we discovered what to do, it was still painful. We've seen images that we haven't seen in our whole careers. I've been practicing for 20 years, primarily in hospitals, and all of a sudden we're dealing with something that was very, very new. Mm -hmm. And so through all, throughout all that pain, I saw what the, what the disease looks like. You know, I saw how uh, sick people could get. I saw how quickly people could pass away. Uh, look like they're going to do well. I mean, it's just been a completely different year. I really wanted to get that behind us, and I wanted to do my part. And seeing what I've seen, knowing what I know, and experiencing what I've experienced with other healthcare providers, I was looking forward to getting the vaccine. So mm -hmm. I got it like about the second or third day that it was available, mm -hmm. the Pfizer vaccine. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time, um, novel, of course, we're not used to giving, getting vaccines uh, at that particular time of the year. We usually get the flu vaccine a little earlier. Mm -hmm. I got it in my left arm because I'm right-handed and I wanted to get it in an area where I was going to have less activity. You have a needle to the arm, so you're going to feel some, uh, like yeah. there's a needle to your arm. Yes. But then after they take that out, um, I was fine. I had some soreness there. I didn't have any systemic effects. And when I mm -hmm. say systemic, I mean I didn't get like a fever, I didn't get any chills, I didn't get any soreness anywhere else, really just very local um, pain, as what you might, uh, you know, Similar anticipate. to the flu shot. Some people experience that with the flu vaccination, right? I have heard about people having that, that's mm -hmm. right. And then um, because I got it as soon as possible, the first one that was available was the Pfizer vaccine, mm -hmm. Pfizer-BioNTech. And um, then three weeks later, on the ninth, I believe, of this year, three mm -hmm. weeks later, I got the second shot mm -hmm. and uh, very pleased about it, mm -hmm. very pleased. I did get the soreness again. Mm -hmm. So right when the needle went in, I thought, uh-oh, you know, did, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is too easy because I had soreness almost right away the first time. Um, and I was even a little worried, like, oh, okay, I hope I didn't go through all this to get like half of the shot or something because it just seemed too easy. Right. But then right, the next right. day, um, I stayed up watching a football game uh, really late at night, um, but the, uh, one day after that, I got some chills, mm -hmm. and I wondered, is it because of the shot, or is it because I was sleep deprived? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really certain. Then I went to work, and I started sharing um, with my friends and other people that got the second shot, and mm -hmm. they were saying they had chills. I heard people saying they had chills, and I thought, okay, that's probably... Okay. It was and these are other medical professionals? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, people that were, um, they actually were in line with me, um, at the same mm -hmm. time getting the first shot and the second shot. Okay. That's right. 
Yeah, so other than those those mild chills, which a lot of people would equate to the flu vaccine, because I get the flu vaccine every year. Yes. And one time I got the flu vaccine, then went to the gym, and I couldn't tell if it was a good workout for the soreness or if it was from the flu vaccine. Right. But other than that, 100%, you're good to go. Not only have I been good to go, but, you know, starting with this year, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to be doing some more uh, working out, I'm going to get mm -hmm. in shape, and so I've been hitting my sprints on a very regular basis, and um, changed my diet a little bit. You know, so I'm not only stable, I'm actually getting better. So I'm pretty happy about well, that. Well, God bless you, and that that's great, dear. Because again, you're a friend of mine. I care about you, mm -hmm. so it, it's good to hear that. Not only are you okay, but you're actually doing better. Sticking to my New Year's resolution, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so far, you know. COVID vaccine, check. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> diet enhancement, check. Working mm -hmm. out, check. That's right. Everybody should do that. Uh, I have a, some technical questions okay. because, you know, I, I, I have a lot of friends. Yes. Most of my friends aren't doctors, aren't mm -hmm. medical professionals, don't have the experience, not only the training that you had, mm -hmm. but you were firsthand in the hospitals dealing with these patients, the families, the medical professionals, the essential workers, and saw the stress that it took not only on the patients, but on everybody involved in there. So what my goal is today in the short time that we have is to get some of these technical questions put out in layman's terms. Yes. So a, I can understand them, mm -hmm. and our viewers can understand them, and have more uh, effective discussions and make better choices about their own health and the health of their loved ones. Certainly. So the first one was, how long after exposure or infection will a COVID test pick up and show positive results, if, if that's even something that they have an answer to yet. So if I get exposed, I'm right. going to travel. Mm -hmm. Say I get exposed in an airplane. Right. I land. I go to an urgent care someplace and get tested. Mm -hmm. If I get exposed in that airplane, would that test pick it up? It would, but mm -hmm. it probably is going to take several days. So okay. we've been thinking about five to ten days. Five to ten days. Okay. Now, I should just give just a little bit more background. What happens when we get an infection is that that virus will actually go into our cell mm -hmm and train our cells to make more virus. And when that happens, um, that's what gives us the inflammatory response. Okay. Uh, so we can get the fever, we can get the chills and sweats and things like that. Um, so the viral load has picked up because our cells have been sort of hijacked really. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now there's an inflammatory situation going on. And that is when we are more likely to be able to get a positive um, okay result on a test but the first day second day it, it this, uh, we need more time okay so you, i probably have to wait so when i get done traveling i at least got a quarantine for five days then go get a test and then continue that quarantine for the uh, the rest of the five ten ten days is what you're saying now that's reasonable okay i mean 14 days we have that uh, because it's conservative and mm -hmm. at, by then we should know for sure right, uh, right, you right. know positive test mm -hmm. but day five day ten Mm -hmm. And of course, um, the question is symptoms, yes or no. Mm -hmm. But day five, 10, we should get a positive test if we've been indeed exposed. Well, uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, again, technical questions, your doctor. We I do, don't have we any. Do the best I, we can. I'm <laughs> never going to get this opportunity again sure. <laughs> to be able to ask a doctor these questions. So I want you to talk about the difference between the vaccines. There, there's a couple vaccines that require two doses, 21 days apart. And now Johnson & Johnson is supposed to be coming out with a vaccine that only requires one dose to maintain effectiveness. Is, can you talk about the difference between those? Is there a different technology or administration process? They're definitely different technologies, mm -hmm. and so the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna, those that are available to us right now, those are based on different technology, mRNA technology, which we can talk about um, mm -hmm. more. And the Johnson and Janssen, um, their technology was more traditional, really. And, um, but to address your question specifically, what you're asking about is, um, why is it that some vaccines you need, like a booster. Mm -hmm. That's most, actually. So when we get the MMR from childhood, mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, uh, there's a need for a booster. And when we mm -hmm. try to skip that booster, uh, mm -hmm. what we found is that we don't have full immunity. And so the issue of um, immunity, we can test with antibodies. So some uh, vaccines show immunity after one administration and the others 
um, don't show the same amount. Okay. So just for instance, uh, what we're discovering with Pfizer is that on the 21, on the 21st day, and we don't have beyond that, okay. but on the 21st day we have about 40 to 52 percent um, antibodies present, 42, okay. uh, 52 percent immunity. And then after the second one, that's when we get that 94, 95 percent, but that's okay. later, it's about nine or ten days after the second shot. Right, so I wouldn't jump out of an airplane with a parachute with a 52% chance of opening, no. but maybe with a 94% chance of opening, I would give it a little more consideration. Absolutely. I'd like it to be 100. Yeah, but, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. But no, no, see, that's information that I did not know, mm -hmm. and that's because this is so new, mm -hmm. it's impossible to have longitudinal studies that right. go over since the time we discovered it. That's right. Right, And then we've really only been administering vaccines in the first, second, and third phase trials since, what, midsummer? Correct. To, to do this. So that, that's great information, that those, those numbers. Now, you know, I might just mm -hmm. add, that's a really good point, what you're making, because I do hear people say, oh, but we don't have the long-term information yet. Uh, and then sometimes people will ask me, um, do we have any long-term studies on these vaccines? <laughs> How is that possible? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just became available like mm -hmm. a month and a half ago or so. Right. But we do know now we are starting to get long-term, several months, mm -hmm. um, long-term information about COVID. Right. Uh, which is, you know, not pretty. Because um, we're hearing a lot of COVID fog, um, a lot of energy. Can that you people explain don't COVID have. fog? Sure. So you can, you'll probably um, remember back to when you had any infection, you just felt sleepy and you felt tired. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably didn't feel like uh, it was a good day to do your taxes on that day. Right, you know, right. you just thought, okay, if I go and lay down, you know. So you get sleepy, you might get a headache, uh, you have some fever. Um, basically, you have an infection, but it's systemic and it's going everywhere. So it's affecting our nervous system and it's affecting all of our muscles. So we have some generalized pain. When that virus is over, it doesn't lift so quickly many times after the COVID disease has run its course. Mm -hmm. And so we have people that I hear about on a pretty regular basis that had COVID, but now they're saying, you know, I don't feel as high performing as I did. I don't have mm -hmm. my same energy. I really haven't gotten my same sleep pattern. I'm hearing this from colleagues mm -hmm. as well as friends and family. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is there a, a, a therapeutic or a treatment that we've uh, put together for that? There really is not. I mean, okay. generally from a health perspective, what we try to do is support our body with the best nourishment mm -hmm. and best sleep, the best environment so that our body is able to heal mm -hmm. really on its own. But the fog part speaks to the, um, the sense that, wow, I just don't feel as, as alert and clear as I did before all this. I don't have the same energy. I don't have the same quickness, the same sharpness. Okay. All right. And unfortunately, that was like the fastest 15 minutes in the world. Wow. We do have to take a break. We're going to be right back in about two minutes after we uh, pay some bills and show some advertisements. There's going to be a really good commercial coming up right now. You may see somebody you recognize in it. So uh, pay attention. We'll be back on The Corey Jones Show with Dr. Sean Hubbard. Stay safe. Hey everybody, it's Corey Jones, Safety Man, safetyman.co. Guess what we have? A Zoom virtual video conference. We're gonna to explain to you all the confusing New Jersey gun laws, how to apply for a firearms ID card, how to apply for a handgun purchase permit, how many guns you can buy at one time, what guns are legal, what guns aren't legal. We're gonna talk about how you safely store and transport them. We're even gonna talk about ammunition. There'll be time for Q&A at the end. And then finally, I'm going to stress the importance of having a qualified, professional, experienced trainer, such as Safety Man, train you to be able to use your firearm to protect your family and yourself from death or serious bodily harm. Just a little bit about me. I'm a retired police officer with 27 years of experience. I used to train the police academy, police officers, and SWAT teams. Saturday, 7 p.m. on the 23rd. Stay tuned for the Zoom. And it's only 10 bucks. Safetyman.co. Be safe. All right, welcome back to the Corey Jones Show. I'm here with Dr. Sean Hubbard, a neurologist, 
or what did you call it? Neuro hospitalist. Neuro hospitalist. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll get that down eventually. And we're talking about COVID. And I know this is a really quick show. We have a lot of information that we want to educate you so you can make the best decisions for your health and the health of loved ones. And yes, we're America, the health of people that we don't even know. So, Dr. Hubbard, I want you to kind of talk about uh, some of the misconceptions out there and misinformation about mRNA, RNA, and DNA, and how these vaccines are helping our bodies fight COVID? Sure. You know, I think that people have heard that gene therapy is coming to our town soon for mm -hmm. a long time. And as it turns out, it has been here, really. So the mRNA technology, I think that's what people are hearing more. And that is what the Pfizer BioNTech, uh, what those companies have done together, and then the Moderna. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there's a gentleman, Uhur Sahin. He is a physician who has done more training primarily in science, really. He's an immunologist. Mm -hmm. And so he was born in Turkey, but he moved to Germany. He started this company, BioNTech, okay. and um, with a couple of other Germans there. And what they were doing was using, they're really trying to treat cancer. And so what they would do is then, let's say you have somebody with a cancer, they go take a piece of that tumor, um, define the genetics of it, and then um, come up with a vaccine that works against that cancer before it gets too systemic and before it goes all over the place. Okay. So this technology was already there, mm -hmm. and um, Uhur Sahin, he had worked with Pfizer before on a flu vaccine. And so when this all started to explode about a year ago, he called up Pfizer and said, hey, you know what? We can, we can work together and uh, knock this out. Okay. And so that's how they uh, became to uh, be a force together. Mm -hmm. It's with their mRNA technology um, and Pfizer's worldwide presence and 171 years of presence in the uh, pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical sphere. Okay. Now that's the mRNA approach. I mean, I'm not sure how deep in the weeds you want to go with the science. Well, I, what uh -huh. I want to do is I, uh -huh. I don't want people being afraid yes. that these vaccines are going to somehow fundamentally change their DNA and affect them as a person. Right. Okay, so <clears throat> th it, they won't. Okay, but, you know, the question would be why, you mm -hmm. know. And so, um, and I understand why there can be some hesitancy. I mean, when we first had microwave ovens come, uh, you know, we were like, no, we want to use the convection oven. It takes longer, but yeah. then sooner or later we got used to the microwave oven. Mm -hmm. But now with the mRNA, essentially what we're looking to do is to expose people to a very non-lethal part of the virus. And so I think that people have gotten used to seeing what a virus looks like with those little spikes sticking out, you know, the mm -hmm. spike proteins and then uh, those spike proteins, what they are used to do is stick to our cell and try to get in our cell and change our cell, mm -hmm. actually. But um, what we've tried to do is use that spike protein as a um, kind of a marker, really. We've taken the genetics of that spike protein and then we've taken that information, that, that message, that, that's what the M and messenger RNA stands for. Okay. That message, give it to our cells and say, here, our cells, produce that spike protein, only the spike protein, not more virus, produce only the spike protein, and then we develop antibodies to that spike protein. Mm -hmm. So really it's a non-lethal part of the virus, and it's not the virus itself. And, um, and it's not changing our inherent DNA. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about RNA, we're not affecting our DNA. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so it, yeah. it, as far as that aspect goes, it's safe and it's not going to cause me to have problems if I choose to have offspring or in my later ages. It's not, no. it's not going to affect no. my aging or my ability to fight other diseases or anything. No, no. Okay. And doctors and uh, researchers would have the same concerns uh, from early on, but these are very highly engineered um, to be health health uh, health conscious mm -hmm. you know to be safe mm -hmm. uh, and effective yeah. so that's the first goal really yeah and it doesn't really do pfizer moderna or johnson johnson any good to produce a vaccine if they have in the back of their head that in 10 years it's no. going to mess people up no because that would take all the companies and put them down the toilet. Exactly. Right. Yeah, it's completely against their interest to develop yeah, yeah. a product that's going to hurt people. Right. Yeah. So the, the other question I wanted to, to move on, um, 
Maybe I'm one of those people who doesn't really care about COVID. I'm, I'm not a believer. I'm not. I'm an anti-masker. I'm not. I wear my mask all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I have my my face covering right here. I know mm -hmm. it's not as good as the N95, mm -hmm. but I still have to be cool at some point. But let's just say that I have that. I, my goal is to convince those people that while they may not be so fearful of contracting COVID themselves mm -hmm. or spreading COVID or they don't believe in masks, the fact that hospitals were before and are again potentially overrun, that could affect their ability to receive care should they have to go to the hospital or loved one, their child, their mother, their, their significant other have to go to the hospital for a traumatic medical uh, incident such as a car accident, a heart attack, a stroke or something. Does the, the overwhelming COVID load on a hospital negatively impact that? I would say short answer, no. Okay. And I would say no because in the hospital, you have personnel that are absolutely trained and very practiced at what they, what we are doing. Mm. And we've been doing this for now, you know, many, many months, at first it was wacky. I mean, we didn't want anybody to show up. So that's when we canceled all elective surgeries and we didn't want to have anything that was unnecessary going on in the hospital until we figured out what we were doing. Now we know what we're doing and we're not canceling um, anything really because we know when somebody shows up and they look like they may have COVID and we know what that looks like now, mm -hmm. we put them in isolation. And before we go see them, we gown up, put gloves on, sanitize, goggles, um, we go see them, take care of them, take that stuff off on the way out the door, mm -hmm. go write a note before we go even talk amongst friends and before we see the next patient. So there is very little chance of getting exposed in the hospital. I think if somebody has chest pain, shortness of breath, a headache, anything that's unusual, mm -hmm. just like two years ago, 10 years ago, they should get into the hospital. It's their safest alternative. Okay. All right. Good. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about, I know this is really important to you and you're very passionate about it, is how the world really came together to get from almost this time last year to where we are now, where we're actually putting out vaccines. And the word on the street was, the word that the government was saying was, we can't expect, and, and the pharmaceutical companies don't expect a vaccine for at least 18 months. Right. At least 18 months. And we're less than a year, and we've already got millions of doses being administered. That's right. That's right. This is extremely fascinating, and I am very excited about this aspect. You know, we have been focused on our particular pain here in America, um, as we should be. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, there's been an extraordinary international effort of scientists who are collaborating toward getting a vaccine together. So if you could imagine, um, right during the Christmas and New Year's holiday last year, that's when some of our scientists that, let's say they work in Germany, uh, Amsterdam, um, and in Turkey, uh, China, all over the world, now they're starting to get wind of this information and they started meeting on this in Geneva, let's mm -hmm. say right around January, February, and trying to figure out how can we get a handle on this. Mm -hmm. So they had a couple of scientists that came from um, China during this meeting and they were completely like, you don't understand how serious this is. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what really got the sense of urgency going and also the sense of we need to work together because this is going to hurt us all. This is going to change our way of life all over the world. Kids won't be going to school. It's going to be very disruptive. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese, what they did was got the sequence. Within 10 days, they got the sequence, the genetic sequence of COVID, and then they shared that information with scientists everywhere, mm -hmm. really, who were going to be in charge of making a vaccine. So mm -hmm. that information was shared to um, other parts of China, um, and I'm talking about now other countries that have made vaccines. Mm -hmm. The Russians have a vaccine that they've called Sputnik, yeah. and they've named it after their, their, their ship, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, India, mm -hmm. um, they've made their own vaccine. They're mm -hmm. probably gonna end up using um, uh, the one Oxford mm -hmm. and AstraZeneca. Um, so Oxford has a vaccine that they've worked on, AstraZeneca, of course, mm -hmm. Moderna, mm -hmm. and of course, um, Pfizer and BioNTech. And BioNTech, of course, they were developing theirs over 
in uh, Germany, mm -hmm. you see. So a lot of this, uh, a lot of this has happened internationally, and it's been going on, and they, it's been on fire. The mm -hmm. collaboration um, level, uh, the worksmanship, mm -hmm. um, the of course they knew what they were doing before, mm -hmm. you know. So essentially, what BeyondTech had was this on-demand mRNA vaccine platform. Mm -hmm. Now, go figure, you know, on demand. So you give us the genetics and then we'll push out a vaccine. Wow. And they had this wow. for cancer. So as we were speaking earlier, they would have it against cancer before it became systemic. So now they were just sitting and waiting for an opportunity. And when that opportunity came right around, say, February. Now, in February, when they all met, and this was an international meeting, mm -hmm. they gave it the name. So now we knew it was not just coronavirus, but mm -hmm. uh, it was given the name of COV, uh, SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. and then they gave the disease. Now you have the virus, um, you may get um, infected with the virus and then develop the fever and chills and all that stuff, mm -hmm. so that's the disease. Mm -hmm. And they gave it the disease, <clears throat> COVID-19. Mm -hmm. After that, then, you had um, all of this collaboration going on really everywhere. I'm talking about South Africa, right, even. Right. Uh, Brazil, you see. So they're starting their vaccines now today, too. This mm -hmm. has been going on, and it's been a very uh, a tremendous, uh, fantastic effort on, on behalf of science, scientists all over the world. And it's a part of the story that we really don't hear about, and we don't really talk about uh, mm -hmm. that much. Um, when they met in Geneva, the idea was, okay, how do we, what are we gonna call success? And they figured, okay, uh, we needed to be able to um, um, work against 50% of the population, okay, 50% oh, effective, rather. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to be able to get this done um, in 18 months. And they really thought that was pretty ambitious. Mm -hmm. And so they started going to work. And because of this on-demand mRNA vaccine platform, really we just needed the genetics. And in 63 days later, it was being put into man. That's phenomenal. You know, it's a phenomenal <laughs> part of the story and it is, it's very exciting. Uh, but it, it does make sense, you know, I can understand people saying, wow, you know, that happened so fast, I don't know, you know, uh, maybe mm -hmm. it came out too fast, maybe there's some other influences that made um, this uh, availability happen, and maybe it's not ready, you know. Right. But really, uh, these scientists knew what they were doing. They didn't just start uh, a year ago. They've been mm -hmm. working on this really for 10 years, and we just needed genetic, genetic information from uh, China, and then people to work together. And so that's been a success story. So now, the success, the success story that we were having with the uh, coronavirus, do you think that the technology, the collaboration, the speed of which we did this will actually help us with other diseases such as cancer? And I know we got to wrap up soon, but with, with, with cancer and other diseases? It clearly will. Okay. So um, one of the reasons why it was available is because COVID wasn't the first uh, epidemic pandemic. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, starting back in 2003, um, we've had like four or five uh, really, uh, you had MERS, mm -hmm. uh, we had the, the flu, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the um, bird flu. I mm -hmm. mean, there have been multiple, really. Right, right. And scientists have worked, they had some smaller projects um, for which they developed vaccines, but they didn't have to scale them up. Right. Um, and then, of course, we were using the vaccines to develop uh, approaches toward cancer. Okay. So it's going to be very interesting um, in the future with right. uh, gene therapy. Dr. Sean, thank you so much for all that information. I hope everybody watches this, shares it with a friend, and let's get the real facts out there to people so they can make good decisions to help, again, not only yourself, but your family, your friends, and every person alive today. Let's help them. How can people get a hold of you if they want to send you some more questions or maybe even consult you as a physician? Sure. Um, they can find me at drshawnhubbard.com. So that's D R S E A N H U B B A R D.com. And that's my website. And of course, I'm on social media um, Dr. Sean Hubbard, Facebook, and same thing, Instagram. And mm -hmm. I'm out there. I'm in the community and always looking forward to help. Yeah, I, this, this, this gentleman cares a lot. That's why I'm friends with him. That's why we, we go on each other's shows and try to educate the public to keep the public safe. Thank you for tuning in this week to The Corey Jones Show. Our goal, as always, is to keep you safe and to help you keep those around you safe. Come back next week for The Corey Jones Show. Safetyman.co, be safe and be ready.